Hello everyone and welcome to the control room of the Atlas Experiment at the LHC here at CERN. My name is Stephanie and together with my colleague Liao Chan, we will take you on a tour through the Atlas control room. Yes, um, hello uh, everyone, my name is Liao Shan and welcome to join this live event. Um, I am the uh, event display coordinator of ATLAS and today here we are going to take you on a tour in the ATLAS control room where we will be visiting several desks in the control room and talking to some data and operation experts who will help us to understand what is happening and how things work. At the end of this tour, we will come back here for a Q&A session where we will answer your questions. So feel free to post all your questions in the chat. To first put into perspective where we are right now. So 100 meters below our feet, we have the Atlas Cavern with the Atlas Experiment and the LHC. The LHC accelerates particles to almost the speed of light and then brings them to collision in the LHC experiments like Atlas. And um, the ATLAS detector um, wants to measure all of the particles that are created in these collisions. And the detector is built out of several layers um, which are dedicated for, uh, to uh, detect uh, specific particles. So the innermost layer closest to the collisions is the inner detector which measures charged particles. Then we have the calorimeters where most particles get stopped and leave all of their energy. And then the outermost layer are for muons because muons, they just pass through the calorimeter almost like it's nothing, but we still want to measure them. Yeah, and our tour will start from right here. Um, you should be able to see a map of the control room and starting from where we stand, first we will visit the station of ship leader and run control where we'll meet our run coordinator. Our second step will be the trigger desk where we will meet our trigger and level one callow experts. And then we proceed through the front of the room and arrive at the inner detector desk where we meet all the detector experts here. Finally, we will come back here for a Q&A session. So let's start our tour now. And now we are heading over to, the, to our first station, which is the shift leader and the run control desk. It's right in the center of the room. And we arrived and we are now here with one of our run coordinators, Sylvia. Hello, Sylvia. Can you tell us what's going on right now? Hello, yes, I'm Syria. Uh, it's going on, we have stable beam in the accelerator. Uh, that means that we have stable uh, collisions. You can see from the screen here, this is the page. Page one is called uh, how LAC communicates with us. Instead, we have protons and stable beam. So that means that we are taking meaningful data. And here we have the profile of how the collisions look like in terms of luminosity from us and uh, from CMS. So we came at the perfect time. Yes. Um, can you explain us a little bit more how a detector is operated and how everything is set up? Yes, yeah, so uh, we learn basically in the morning from LSC what is the plan. Now we are not yet uh, with the full ring. That means we are not yet in stable uh, uh, configuration. They are in the intensity ramp up. That means that uh, they are waking up from the winter shutdown and before summer, they need to increase uh, one by one the parameters, uh, first the, the uh, number of bunches and then the intensity. So basically for us means that every day is different. So we have to organize very carefully with all the subsystem uh, involved in the operation, uh, the data taking. So in the meeting uh, in the morning, we organize everything. We set the plan of the day that we draft here and the shift leader that is on my left, need to follow up uh, during the day. Since we are in operation, they are here day and night. And we follow up um, depending on the, as I said, uh, the plan that was drafted. And we, need, we need that to uh, take data. So here you have the run control IGUI, where we put all the detector of the Atlas experiment in running state consistently. And we also check that everything is uh, green here, let's say, Everything is consistent with the voltages, readout, uh, and uh, so on. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. I see a lot of green, so it looks like everything is running quite smoothly. Today, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot, Sylvia. Yeah. 
We will continue our tour now. Where do we go next? Okay, thank you, Sylvia. Now we leave the ship leader and run control desk, and we move on to our next station, which is the trigger desk. Here is the trigger desk, and my co-host Stephanie is in charge of this desk. She's a super expert in the trigger system. So, Stephanie, do you want to tell us something about the Atlas trigger system? Yes, so the LHC collides particles um, every 25 nanoseconds. So uh, this means we uh, would get 400 million events every second. This is way too much for us to read out, process, and then also analyze. So we have to select the events which are interesting. And to do this, we use the so-called trigger system. It has two stages, a level one and an HAT stage. At the first stage, we make a rather rough uh, course decision, but it needs to be very quickly. And at the second stage, we have a little bit more time. And there we can run already some more sophisticated algorithms to select interesting events. And this, with this, we then cut down uh, the number of events that we record to about 1,000 per second. So, and now we want to know a little bit more about the level one system. And we have one of our level one trigger experts here, Reese from level one Carlo. Hello, Reese. Hello. Can you please tell us a little bit more about level one Carlo? Okay, so as the name suggests, the level one Carlo, well, the level one Carlo is the level one calorimeter trigger. So we use the calorimeter information to try and do this first pass of cutting down the data from the 40 uh, megahertz of the LHC collisions down to 100,000 times a second that we can ship to the higher level trigger. So this is done, we use the calorimeter information, which is the energy deposition, and we have about 7,000 channels, which we're looking at in real time to try and search for interesting clusters of uh, energy in the detector and select those events for being saved. So what is new for level one Carlo for run three, for data taking now? So for run three, we've had an upgrade. We have upgraded modules on both our side and on the calorimeter side. So on top of the 7,000 channels that they're sending for the legacy path, now from the liquid argon calorimeter, we get 10 times more information. And that gives us a much better granularity and it means we can more clearly see the clusters that we're selecting and make better decisions. So we can make uh, a more precise selection of the events that we want to keep offline so that more good events go into analysis. Thanks, Reese. This sounds really good and this will make many analyzers very happy. Thanks a lot again. And now we continue our tour. Where do we go next? Um, so yeah, let's continue through the front of the room and we just leave the trigger desk. Now we are passing through two important desks in the control room, the data quality desk, which is uh, the data quality shifter sits here and then they will uh, monitor the quality of the data we record. Another desk is the SLIMOS desk, where uh, the shift leader in matters of safety guarantees the safety of both the detector and the operation crew. So now we are proceeding to our next station, um, which is the inner detector desk. And the inner detector is controlled here, but at this desk, we are going to meet all of our detector experts. Before we talk to our first expert, a quick reminder, please post your questions in the comments so that we can um, answer them in our Q&A session right after our chat with um, our detector experts. So the first detector expert we talked to is Vinicius, Hi. and he, <laughs> hello, and he is an expert on the inner detector. Can you tell us, please, a little bit more about the inner detector? Yeah. So the inner detector is the first layers, the inner layers of the of the detector in Atlas. So it's the detector that's responsible for uh, receiving, like, detecting all the little signals left by charged particles and they uh, you know the closest points uh, to the point of interaction so our closest detector uh, which is the IBL um, is at 3.3 centimeters from the from the beam pipe where the collisions actually happen and then from there we have our pixels at CT and TRT which uh, are all inserted inside a magnetic field and with information from these detectors we can figure out what's the position where these particles came from, what actually happened in the collision, and the uh, energy and momentum of all the particu uh, particles coming out of it. 
Okay, so a lot of <laughs> different detectors here. So um, what are the challenges for the inner detector, or in particular Pixel, for Run Free? Well, I think uh, as the inner detector is the innermost, we have to like really cope with this uh, amazing amount of data that LHC provides. So right now we are operating at 50 collisions. Every time that the beams collide, we have 60, 50, 60 collisions, proton-proton uh, collisions, proton -proton collisions at the same time. Um, so we have to deal with huge amounts of data and occupants in our de detector and all this radiation that affects uh, our silicon detectors very much. So we need to be very careful to operate this uh, and such that we provide good data for physics reconstruction. And for this, you also need to monitor uh, the inner you know, detector systems very closely. And I see you have a lot of screens and windows open here. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit what uh, we are looking at? Yeah. So uh, if you are if you are a shifter, you can uh, your first job is to look at these things that are luckily very green because they are the safety of the detector. So here you have the entire inner detector in one page in which uh, you're looking over at pixels, SCT and TRT, and they are uh, all, you check the temperatures and whether or not they are configured correctly. And then here in pixel, you can see all of our layers, they're also uh, operating very well. Um, and then on the left, you can see uh, here, I put a display of what the data stream from our detectors look like. So this is live and you can see we're taking collisions and you, you, you see that uh, we, we have data coming, coming from all of our pixel detectors. Uh, it's, it's cool that you came today because then uh, we, have, we are quite busy. Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Perfect timing. So one final question for you. It's a little bit more personal. Why do you like to do uh, this job? Why do you like operations? Um, to be honest, I like it because it, it's addictive. Uh, it's, it's high pressure, but it's also very satisfying when things work out and, uh, you, you know, like, uh, you have these conditions that which are the hardest that any experiment has ever operated under and we still manage to just take great physics data. It's, uh, it's I don't know, it's very rewarding. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for your insight into the inner detector. I leave you to work now. <laughs> Okay, for those who just joined us, we are in the Atlas control room and now we are at the inner detector desk where we will be speaking to different detector experts uh, for the Atlas operation. Um, we just talked to the experts from the inner detector and outside the inner detector we have the calorimeter system. Um, so in the control room, you can see just right behind the inner detector desk, we have the calorimeter system uh, desk, but uh, the shifters are busy there, so we are not going to disturb them. But we have an expert for the calorimeter system. So hello, Andriana. Hello. Um, yeah. So can you tell us something about the Atlas calorimeter system? Uh, yes, so in Atlas we have um, two major calorimeter systems. So first off, calorimeters are for measuring the energies of particles. And we have it in two parts. So one part is the liquid argon calorimeter, which measures the energy of particles such as electrons and photons. And then we have the tile calorimeter, which is a hadronic calorimeter. So it measures the energy of hadronic particles. Um, and they are um, kind of liquid iron is wrapped around the inner detector. And then outside of that, you have the, the tile calorimeter. Um, and they are based on different technologies. So um, one is, uh, is has as an active material, we call it, which is measuring the impact of particles with uh, liquid argon, which is a noble gas. And the other one is using scintillating tiles. Okay, so we have two different technologies for the Atlas calorimeter system. And then do we have something new for RON3? Yes, um, so uh, especially on the side of the electromagnetic calorimeter, so the liquid argon, uh, we had a major upgrade. Uh, you've heard already uh, before from RIS, uh, from Level on Calo, that uh, the calorimeters are now sending much higher granularity information to the trigger. So more information is always good. You can um, better decide what an event that you that you have in, in your um, detector uh, is interesting or not. And using this uh, information, 
which is now available also already before on trigger level, we can decide in a better way whether an, an event uh, that we observe in Atlas is something interesting for physics, potentially interesting or not. So uh, yes, this is one major upgrade that a lot of people have been working on. Uh, not the detector itself was upgraded, but mainly the readout, but nevertheless it was a very uh, long <laughs> and very, very um, interesting upgrade. Yes. Yeah, so the upgrade of the carometer system is uh, actually uh, the the hardware basis for we have better performance in the level one Calo system. Um, and then we are not visiting the shifters today, but maybe you can tell us something about what the shifters usually do during their shifts. So the shifters are busy, I'm not, that's I'm here. Um, we are, the shifters are monitoring our system 24 seven. Um, we have shifts like uh, turnarounds every eight hours um, and they're looking whether the data that we collect from in this case calorimeters so tile and lar liquid argon um, are good data and um, they have um, screens or, or panels such as this one uh, which we have probably seen with the pixels so ideally it looks like this everything is green <laughs> we like green um, and in this case everything is running fine which is good because we're in stable beams which means we're collecting data um, and if there's a problem if a problem occurs the shifter uh, usually directly calls the uncle expert who then can solve ideally the problem as quick as possible so yes <laughs> yeah and i also see a colorful map here is this also related to the carometer operation well it is a map from level on calo but uh, we do stare at it a lot because it displays the noise that is existent in our calorimeter. In, the, in this case, this is uh, the so-called JFEX rates, oh, if I could figure out this mouse. So here we see in which region the, the detector is noisier and in which regions it's less, it's less noisy. And if a problem occurs, you will usually spot it easily in this kind of uh, map. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Andriana. So now we go to our third and last uh, detector expert. And we are here with Costas. Hello, Costas. And um, as many of you might already guess, when we introduced uh, briefly the Atlas detector, the outermost layer is the muon spectrometer. And Costas, can you please tell us a little bit more about the muon spectrometer? Yes, so uh, the, the muon spectrometer, the primary job of the system is to detect and measure the properties of the, of the muons. So the, the muons are charged uh, particles, elementary particles that, as you said, they penetrate the, the full detector. So that's why also the muon system sits at the outer layer of the Atlas detector. Uh, and it's a very large system, so it is composed of five different gaseous detector technologies that they are covering a very large uh, detection area, uh, larger than um, a football field. And they has in total uh, about 3.5 million electronic channels that we are reading out in order to uh, detect uh, those, uh, those muons. Um, so it's, it's a rather large system. The detector technologies you can also see here in our display are MDT, RPC, TGC, and now recently Micromegas and STGC, which is one of the upgrades. Um, Thanks for this overview of the muon spectrometer and you already mentioned the word upgrade so there is something new. What is new for the muons uh, for run 3? Yeah, so it's, um, we had a, a rather big change in the muon spectrometer during the last um, uh, long shutdown period which lasted from 2016 to 2018. So uh, for us the biggest upgrade was the, um, uh, com the construction and installation of um, new detectors, we call these new small wheels. So this replaced the old uh, small wheels that we had in the experiment. The small in the naming of the project is rather unfortunate because these are 10 meter diameter detectors. So these are uh, large in fact, and quite complex. So that's also been uh, quite a challenge for the collaboration to construct those and also to install them in Atlas and commission them. And uh, these uh, were installed in 2021 and are taking data since last year. And these are already integrated inside the, um, the rest of the immune spectrometer. So you see them here in our nice uh, DCS display. So the not so small, new small wheel, how did it feel when you saw it running for the first time being switched on and the first uh, muons being detected uh, with the new small wheel? 
Yeah, this was quite a moment, I admit, since uh, a lot of us have been working also in parallel to the operations of the legacy immune system, also to the construction of the new small wheel for, for years. So it's a, a really rewarding uh, moment when you see, you know, something that you have been building from uh, from very small pieces, small detectors to this large system, uh, 10 meter diameter to install it and take data with that together with the rest of the Atlas subsystems. Uh, this has been a quite exciting moment for everyone. Yes, yeah, truly nice to see that it's now also running after so much hard work from so many people. Indeed. So you have also a lot of screens here. And again, we don't want to disturb the muon shifter who is very uh, busy and monitoring the muon system on the other side of the room. But maybe you can tell us a little bit what, um, what needs to be monitored. What do the shifters need to look out for carefully? Yeah, the, so the, the standard and actually the first the most important thing is to monitor the, um, the state and status of the detector of our hardware. So this is like the health of the detector. And for this, we are relying on, on the Atlas uh, detector control system, which has, you can see here, uh, a snapshot of that. Uh, it is built in uh, a hierarchy, so in a tree structure, so that each of the thousands of uh, hardware elements that we have uh, are uh, interconnected in this tree structure and we can detect even if a single element goes bad, it propagates the state and the status up to the top level and we can see it because of course it is impossible for someone to watch uh, in parallel uh, thousands of elements, right? So we have this, uh, this structure. So this is one thing. Um, uh, this also allows us to quickly react on, on problems. Uh, so this allows us to increase the efficiency of our detectors. Right. And then the, the other thing is the data. Uh, so here we are monitoring that uh, the quality of the data we are we're taking is good and, and as expected because these data, of course, are needed then for Atlas for the reconstruction and the analysis eventually that we are performing. So these are two main tasks. And the shifter is also supported by on-call experts that you see here, the list that we have, because the shifter, of course, cannot know everything. So whenever there is a problem that he doesn't understand, he, he calls. One of the oh, that's interesting. Um, how does it work? So I mean, I'm a shifter now. I look at something and something looks weird, but I don't know why or what. What what would I do? Yeah. So then, of course, th there are we have um, we have uh, uh, documentation, of course, where one can look at uh, known problems or issues, or, or, and if there is an easy way to solve this. But otherwise, in order not to lose time, because such problems may also affect the data taking. We have people that are on call 24-7, uh, they, they have shifts and they are being called to react quickly and try to solve this problem together with the shifter. So we rely also on those experts for, for running our system. Okay, so they can also be called in the middle of the night. Yeah, anytime, 24-7. <laughs> but hopefully everything is running smoothly and they don't get Usually, called. Usually, yes, not always, of course. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Kostas, for your Thank insight you. at the Muon Spectrometer. And yeah, good luck with the new small wheel that everything went smoothly also this year. Thanks a lot. So now we are going um, to, uh, so now we are done with our uh, detector experts, but we want to talk to another expert, Liao Shan. So Liao Shan already introduced herself at the beginning that she is an expert and in charge for the event displays. And maybe some of you already spotted some pretty uh, um, pictures in the background. And those are event displays. And Liao Shan, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, those pretty pictures? Yes. Um, so event display is a tool that visualizes the events. We've been talking about particles, tracks, energy deposits, muons, and so on. But what do they look like? Um, so event display is, is such a tool that it can translate the data into some images. And we have several event displays in Atlas. The one you see uh, here is called Atlantis. Usually we project it on the wall, as you can see in the background, but uh, we are projecting the same thing on this screen here. So from these uh, images, you can actually see the particles interactions inside the Atlas detector. And we have several different views here. Um, so this one is the XY view. It's perpendicular to the beam direction. So it allows us to see more activities in the uh, transverse plane, so-called. 
and then we have a different zoom in version of this so that we can actually see different part of the detector. Uh, for example, this one is zoomed in to the very inner part of it so we can see the activities in the inner detector and you can see the hits, the tracks and many things going on there. And outside the inner detector we can see the uh, calorimeter where you see some energy deposits showing in uh, yellow, yellow blocks. And then outside the calorimeter, we have the muon system where you see all the tracks of the muon. And then at the bottom, we have a side view of the atlas detector so that we can see more activities along the beam direction. And finally, at this corner, you can see a legal plot, um, which is showing the energy deposits inside the calorimeter system. Thanks for the explanation of the event display in Liaoshan. And I thought that they were changing all the time. Are those event displays of the collisions that are happening right now? Yes, we are coming at the right time that there are some real collisions happening in the Atlas. And the events you are seeing here is in live, in real time. So we reconstruct the data. We just recorded a few seconds or 10 or 20 seconds ago. And with the fast reconstruction, they are uh, they are showing here as an images and we can really see the activities in the detector in real time. So at the trigger desk, um, we learned that we record around 1000 events every second. Do you make an event display for each of those events? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Um, so with an event rate of 25 nanoseconds per event, it's impossible to see all of them. And even with the help of the trigger system, the output rate is reduced to a few thousand events per second. It's still not possible for us to see every one of them. Um, fortunately, we don't have to see every one of them and we only sample a subset of the events. Um, yeah, and then uh, with this one, we can see the uh, time changing of the status of the detectors. Um, and then the shifter can uh, take a look at uh, some uh, randomly sampled event to learn the current status of the detector. Um, so this is what we are doing and what the, the data quality shifter is doing in the control room. And can only the data quality shifter look at those event displays or the other shifters as well? Yeah, the other shifters can also take a look at the event displays. So they have their special configuration and then they can interact with the events to zoom in into a particular sub detector or to change the projection to another view so that they can analyze the uh, events in real time. Um, and they can also talk to their experts and the experts can open the events outside the control room uh, with also the, the real time events that we are producing uh, in the control room so that the experts can uh, use them to communicate with the shifters and understand problems. And I see that these event displays are also shown on the wall projected for everyone who's in the control room. And especially when we get the first collisions in the year, um, people are looking at this <laughs> point uh, very uh, closely to see uh, these nice event displays. Thank you so much, Liao Shan, for explaining us the event displays and showing us these beautiful pictures. So with this, we are at the end of our tour. And now it's time for our Q&A session. OK, let's move back to our starting point. And to everyone who is watching or connected late, so we are in the Atlas control room. You missed the tour, but uh, the video will be available afterwards for watching, so um, you can go back. And for everyone who followed and might have uh, some questions now, you still have time to post them in the comments and we try to go through all of them. And yeah, now we are back. Uh, Leo Shan is with me and also Sylvia, our one coordinator, is back. Hello. <laughs> so to get the questions, let me quickly... Uh, them. Okay, so our first question is from Almeida. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. And uh, the question is, what is Atlas' recent research focus? Liao Shan, can you tell us what is Atlas' recent uh, research focus? 
Yeah, so ATLAS is a general purpose experiment and then we have many frontier uh, topics in ATLAS. For example, uh, for the Higgs boson, we know we just celebrated its 10 years uh, anniversary of the discovery last year, but there are still some mystery of the Higgs boson. Uh, for example, we still don't know the uh, self-coupling of the Higgs and that is the current focus, uh, one of the current focus in the ATLAS exp experiment that we are studying the di Higgs production. And also on the other hand, we have some mystery uh, with the dark matter and with some extra dimension with some uh, long lived particles, uh, many, many of that. And that's uh, all covered in the Atlas. Um. Thanks, Leo Shan. Our next question is from Leandra. And the answer asks, uh, how many data will you save today for analysis later? Sylvia, can you tell us how much data we will save today? Today we saved uh, about a terabyte of data uh, in the current run. Yeah. That's quite impressive. That's yes. a lot of data to analyze, but you look very happy about it. Oh yes, everything was smooth and uh, we hope our, our analysis team is happy with those data and we can extract something interesting. Thanks, Sylvia. Our third question, I unfortunately don't have a name, oh, but that's a fine. So the question is, how many people are involved to make Atlas happen? Oh, that's a good question. There are a lot of people involved in making Atlas happen. And it's also a question, for what stage? So we need a lot of people to build the Atlas detector, but then also to operate it, and then also to analyze the data. So, uh, Sylvia, do you have a rough idea how many people are involved in the detector operations? So in operation, I would say hundreds. And then there are, I would say, thousands of people who built the detector and might not be anymore in operation. And then many others to analyze data. And uh, yeah, so thousands in total. And of course, this also changes over time, right? People are coming and leaving the collaboration. Um, so then to our fourth question from Floor. Um, if the Atlas, if Atlas could be improved, what would it be? Uh, an inner detector even closer than 3.3 centimeters to let's say one centimeter from the collisions, better computing power or more sensitive uh, detectors? So there are already some suggestions. Um, Liao Shan, do you want to add anything to this? <laughs> um, yeah, so we have some ongoing project for the Atlas upgrade. Um, it's called the phase two upgrade. Uh, this includes uh, updating our inner detector to uh, silicon based so that we will have a large radius silicon based detector which has a better resolution for the hits and for the tracks. And with that, we can measure the uh, charge particle momentum into higher precision. Um, so that's one of the projects that uh, the Atlas upgrade team is working on. And there is another project called the high granularity timing detector. Um, it's part of the detector that we put in the NCAP region so that uh, other than the three dimensional position information, we also measure the time of the arrival of the particle so that we have a fourth dimension. Uh, this helps us to reject some uh, uh, multiple interaction that happens in a single collision so that we can uh, reject our background and measure the signal better. Thanks, Liao Shan. So there is truly um, a lot to look forward to uh, for the future. So our next question is again from Floor. Can the LHC also collide muons together or are they too short lived? Or can the LHC only do proton proton collisions? Sylvia, since you are uh, working very closely with the LHC, can you answer this question? So muons are not yet in the program, but there are uh, heavy ions in the program. So LHC, instead of colliding protons, can collide uh, ions of lead. We did also ions of uh, xenon in the past, and in the future is also in the program to collect oxygen. And uh, depending on the collisions of the different uh, elements that you have, you have a different uh, um, kind of physics that you can uh, analyze and you can explore. But today, uh, what, what did we see today in the event displays? Were those proton collisions or heavy ion collisions? 
The standard LHC physics is proton-proton collisions, and this in the run tree is 13.6 TV. So this is the standard. Towards the end of the year, for one month uh, this year, we will have lead-lead uh, uh, -lead collisions. And for this, um, you can just continue as it is, or you need to do special preparations? Of course, we need special preparation. We have a new detector, not a new, but uh, the so-called zero-degree calorimeter detector that we will insert in purpose only for heavy ions. And then, of course, on the trigger side, we have a separate menu that we have to prepare in advance and uh, use. It's not the standard uh, physics that we are going to uh, explore. So we have completely different signatures, let's say. Okay, so it will never get boring. <laughs> Okay, our next question is from Magurea Tari. How does it feel to do work uh, on the very tip of science and knowledge? Will you realize if or what kind of special event happen while the experiment is running or only when you filter the data? Do so um, you want to answer this question? Yes, um, so I think this is a more trigger-like question that how we select interesting events. Um, usually what we see in the control room, we, ha we have a feeling about uh, that something is going on, like we are starting the 13.6TV uh, collision at the world record energy. That's something we can tell immediately. But then uh, in terms of whether we are producing some Higgs events and some other interesting events, that's something that we need to analyze the data and then we need to uh, apply some requirement on the data and filter it so that we can really select those events. Thanks, uh, Liao Shan. But yeah, indeed, uh, at the end, we have to look at all of the data also to make sure that it was not just a, a fluke or by chance. So um, yeah, we can't just tell from looking at one event display, for example, but we have to look at all of the data. So the next question is from Chiara. How many people are usually on shift in the control room? This sounds like a question perfect for Sylvia. <laughs> yes, we have eight people on shift 24 hours. So we have shifts of eight hours from 7 to 3, from 3 to 11, and from 11 to 7 in the morning. Those are the shifters. And then we have many experts at the phone that live in the area. And as soon as there is a problem, shifter can rely on them and they can come quickly here to the control room in case there is a problem to be solved. And do you prefer um, when all of the experts are here and it's very crowded or rather when it's only the eight desk shifters? I prefer when it's crowded, but that means because there is something interesting. And also, if it's crowded, it might be also that there is a problem. So, okay, it depends what we prefer. Let's say when it's quiet and we are taking data, then there's only shifters, so it, that is also a good thing. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Our next question is from Russell, and Russell asks, um, where do the protons uh, come from um, before they circulate in the LHC? Um, so yeah, the, the protons don't just come, well, we can't just put them in the LHC. Um, so first they come from a, an oxygen bottle, where all of the electrons are stripped off, and then the protons are accelerated first in a linear accelerated uh, accelerator, and then in um, several circular accelerators. So, and with those, we increase the energy step by step because we can't just go from yeah, zero to um, the maximum energy of the LHC, almost speed of light. So we have to do it in stages. And uh, yeah, the LHC is then the final accelerator where they will then also collide. Our next question is um, from uh, three people asked this. Uh, I guess a lot of people are excited about this. <laughs> from Clara, Amelia, and John. Can you tell us about the ducts in front of the inner detector uh, shifter? What is the function of the rubber ducts? <laughs> Say that you are laughing. <laughs> what are the ducts for? Duct state for that acquisition. So that is, we have the duct in front of the inner detector, but could be in front of the that acquisition computer. And yes, that's for that. So to acquire all the data, we need a data acquisition system. And so that is our mascot, basically. And also, um, when sometimes the shifters are uh, all by themselves in front of the desk and there is an issue, sometimes it helps just to talk to someone and, <laughs> and you can explain a problem to a duck. And this often already is enough to realize what is going on or to find the solution. 
<laughs> so our next question is from, uh, again, from Am Almeida. What are the challenges uh, of the inner detector? Who wants to uh, take up this question? I can take it. <laughs> the challenges for this year are that uh, LEC is pushing in terms of a number of colliding uh, uh, interactions. Uh, so we have the so-called pileup. That means uh, this in the same uh, uh, in the same collision, we have many events overlapping one on top of the other. And the inner detector, as, as the full atlas detector was built uh, 20 years ago, with the conditions that were supposed to be at that time by design. And now LEC is performing so well that we are exceeding the design. And so one of the uh, challenges for our inner detector is the radiation damage and also uh, to be able to record all the tracks at the same moment. So we will have more than 60 events overlapping one over the other. And the inner detector is so close to the interaction point that it is not, it is not easy to distinguish between one and the other. Wow, so it's really um, quite amazing that the inner detector is uh, performing so well, although it was designed for quite some different uh, conditions. <laughs> Thanks, Silvia. So our next question is from Daniel. Daniel, how will this benefit society? It's an interesting question, Diaoshan. How does what we are doing here benefit society? Um, it's an interesting but difficult question. Um, so, uh, fundamental science is something like we we do it uh, because we have curiosity of how nature works, and then uh, we explore the nature. We uh, we realize that uh, we understand the fundamental rule of the nature. And then maybe after many years ago, we realized that we can make use of the rules to make our life better. So this is not something immediately happen, but it will happen in the future. And then we have to uh, have the uh, long tradition to, to proceed on this way so that we have continuously some uh, some people uh, contribute to this area so that we can continuously improve the, uh, our life. Thanks, Liao Shan. And also on the side of detectors and um, uh, the accelerators, the techniques that we need and the materials, um, they often, uh, yeah, they often don't exist before, so we need to uh, develop and or find out how it works. And then in a couple of years, this might also be beneficial uh, outside of science. So um, uh, there is also um, this aspect uh, that we can yeah, give uh, back uh, in form of uh, yeah, technological knowledge. And Sylvia, you want to add something to this? Yeah, many detectors that are developed here for the accelerator uh, experiments are uh, developed uh, from scratch. We study them, we bring, to the, uh, we bring the performance to the limit, and then they can, once uh, we study them, we use uh, they c the same technology can be used, uh, for example, in medicine. Uh, that is uh, a case that is very well uh, used. Uh, so that is uh, something, or in astronomy. So yeah, that is how we could benefit from the society. Thanks, uh, Sylvia. Our next question is um, from Flor again. And this is actually a question directly to Liao Shan. Where can you see which direction the particles curve so you can tell it's a matter or an antimatter particle? Right, this is a very interesting question. So uh, we measure the charged particles in the detector because they leave uh, hits and then uh, they leave tracks. Uh, we can reconstruct the hits to build tracks. And then we have the magnet system in Atlas to bend the trajectory. So uh, if a, a particle is uh, the positive charge, they are bent into one direction. And if they are negative in charge, they are bent into the other direction. So uh, a particle and its an antiparticle, if they are charged, they have uh, uh, different charges and then with the direction of the tracks we can tell if it's a particle or an antiparticle. Thanks, uh, Liao Shan. Our next question is from Il. What is the power consumption of uh, the experiment currently? So yeah, I'm wondering about this myself. Do you know? <laughs> no, I don't have one. <laughs> um, I would say I don't have a number. I really, Alshan, do you know? No, no, <laughs> not on top of my head. Yes. Um, sorry, we can't answer this, this question on top of our heads. 
Um, so uh, the next question is from uh, Rishav. Um, and there are actually two questions. So the first question is about the event displays. And uh, Rishav asks, is the event display called uh, Hypatia? Um, we have one event display called Hypatia, yeah. We have several event displays in Atlas, and some of them are two-dimensional, some of them are three-dimensional. Uh, for the two-dimensional one, Atlantis, it has some different variations, and one of the variations is called Hypatia. Uh, it's uh, mostly used in uh, education. Thanks, Liao Shan. So now the second question from uh, Rishav. I think it's more uh, for Sylvia. Um, Richard wants to know a little bit more about the new small wheel. So we already heard um, a lot from Costas, but maybe you uh, want to add something to that. New small wheel. Uh, what is new from the new small wheel, I would say, is the huge micro-megas detector. It's the first time the resistive micro-megas is uh, built. Before they were small, and the technology was built in purpose for Atlas. And it was very challenging because it's uh, very huge. When you see it in the lab, it stays on the table. When you start to build and build and build, it's a very, it's big as like a building. So yeah, I don't remember what was the question, but <laughs> just more about the new small wheel. Okay. <laughs> that is something, yes. Um, Thanks, Sylvia. Yeah, there is also um, a video on the channel where you can see how the new small wheel was transported here to the Atlas detector and then lowered down and installed. Um, it took in real time um, quite a couple of hours, so you can watch the whole thing, I believe, but also um, a shortened version. So our next question is from Baron. Um, is all the data collected uh, shared freely across the Earth so that all can test it? So um, first, when we take the data, it's not uh, quite um, in this, yeah, immediately shared with um, everyone freely, but um, we release uh, indeed um, uh, data sets that were collected um, after some time after we have checked that everything is fine, also um, openly, so people can also look into this. Um, our next question is from Tyra. How is Atlas attempting to study dark matter? And Liu Shan, you already mentioned dark matter earlier. Um, yeah, um, this is not my research area, but I can try to say something in general. So dark matter is a kind of matter that uh, they usually has very, re uh, very little interaction with the normal matters. Um, but uh, we are in the astronomy, they are uh, detected while their gravitational effect. But in the particle physics, we try to study if there are any models that uh, let them to uh, interact with the standard model particles so that we can detect them while the interaction with the standard model particle. But then this interaction uh, should be very, very small so that they don't violate our observation today. Um, so yeah, we need to collect uh, a lot of data so that uh, we can d detect such a small interaction. Thanks uh, a lot, Liao Shan. Our next question is from Katam. Does it take a lot of time to analyze one terabyte of data? So it depends a bit. Like, um, of course, the data needs to be processed uh, first after it was uh, collected and streamed out. So uh, this takes um, a couple of hours or also days. It depends how much data is really processed. And then for the analysis, here it also depends whether there is already something in place and you're already prepared to analyze it or you want to start from scratch. And this can then ta uh, take several uh, months or so then up to years until you really all of the data is analyzed. And we want to analyze um, not just um, the data from one run like we took today, but rather from all the data that we collected throughout the year or several years, uh, the entire run free, to uh, not let ourselves be fooled by uh, any statistics fluctuations. Our next question is from uh, Kat. A moment. Uh, sorry, Keanu. <laughs> what is the type of readout chips that is used in the inner detector? I don't know. <laughs> Savia is shaking her head. No, sorry, Mini, that is not my expert. <laughs> we don't have an inner detector expert right now with us. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so maybe we need to ask Vinicius afterwards again that he can tell us. Um, our next question is from Yaroslav. Um, uh, do you detect neutrinos? And if it is hard to de um, detect neutrinos, can we detect neutrinos? Basically, neutrino escape. So what we detect is everything but neutrinos. So we try to be as much hermetic as possible. Indeed, the Atlas detector is like a barrel with the M cup, so we cover every, everything and no particle could, uh, in, in principle, escape. If we see a missing uh, part of energy somewhere, we can uh, imply that there was uh, some particle that didn't interact and one of them could have been the neutrino. Thanks, uh, Sylvia. Our next question is from um, Mio. And Mio asks... Uh, oh no, I lost the question, sorry. Um, so our next question is from uh, Keanu again. Is the Hailumi LHC project still underway? Is it still underway? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is uh, still underway. Uh, we will have uh, the longer shutdown uh, tree in 2025 starting. And then, now I don't have the dates in my hand as, until, unless you have. But I, yes, it will start a few years after. And uh, from Atlas side, we are building the upgrade detectors for the Ilumi LAC, yes. Yeah, those are the ones that uh, you already mentioned, Liao Shan, right, the uh, ITK and the uh, uh, high granularity timing detector. Yes. Okay, our next question is from Alfan. Is there an alternate way to lessen the huge amount of electricity uh, consumption um, uh, at CERN? So yeah, that's through uh, CERN and the accelerators and the detectors especially the accelerators, consume quite a lot of energy. But of course, we try to also uh, reduce this where we can. Um, do you <laughs> sorry. Um, I know that, for example, buildings uh, close to LACB experiment, they use uh, the uh, heated water. Uh, there is a water that uh, um, uh, serves as um, uh, cooling, uh, I mean, there is a water that circulates in the experiment to cool down the electronics and this heat is sent to the houses in uh, close to the experiment. So this is how we can start to recycle energy. Oh, this is great. So it's not really lessen lessening the consumption of CERN itself, but it helps to reduce the energy consumption then um, from normal uh, buildings uh, where people live. So this, this is really great. Um, our next question is from crypto uh, can you use uh, can you comment on the use of um, AI uh, in Atlas yeah, can you comment on the use of AI in Atlas um, yes so AI is a very fast uh, uh, fast changing area well, we had been used something like machine learning technologies in the analysis for many years. Um, with that, we build models so that they can uh, be trained and then they can help us to distinguish the signal from background. Um, so that's uh, usually more efficient than we just uh, apply some uh, simple selection ourselves. And these uh, are the methods that we have been used for many years. So nowadays we are also uh, exploring the use of uh, the most advanced AI technology, um, including uh, how we can use them to better do the data analysis and also uh, how we can uh, make use of things like uh, AI assistant to help us to uh, to to do the uh, coding uh, software development faster and more accurate. So we are following these uh, up updates and yes. Thanks uh, Liao Shan. So yeah, we constantly try to improve the way we analyze the data to make the most of the out of the data that we collect. Our next question is from Tyra again. Um, what is your favorite part of working at the Atlas experiment? So for me, my favorite part is um, to work together with um, a lot of people from all over uh, the world and you get quite some nice new perspectives and insights from everyone and also um, that there is a new challenge 
actually, yeah, every day, so it never gets boring. What is your favorite part of Exactly the same feeling, yes. <laughs> so I cannot add something more, yes. <laughs> Very good. And for you, Liao Shan, it's the same? Yes, so we can work with many different people that are from different continents of the world and we learn different cultures. We enjoy this uh, very global environment working here. And also uh, something in particular, I, uh, I really remember the exciting moment when we get the first collisions in the control room and when we see the collision events in the event display. So at that point, we know uh, everything, the detector, the data acquisition system, the trigger, and including LHC, everything is working. So that was really an exciting moment that I remember. Right, so our next question is from Scottilo. Um, if it is a continuous beam passing through four detectors um, to uh, uh, do those collisions affect the data in other detectors or um, are those collisions filtered out afterwards? So, okay, so we are colliding, we have four big experiments at the LHC uh, detector and simultaneously we have collisions in all four. So are there any um, way those collisions um, affect each other in the different detectors? Yes, so ATLAS and CMS are kind of bounded together and the LCB and ALICE uh, as well. So uh, sometimes if we decide to go for a certain condition of the beam, CMS need to agree. And in particular, if we need to have uh, heavy ions, then all the experiments need to agree because the ring is only one, so we can circulate only one kind of particle. But even when we are, we are in standard physics and we have uh, proton collisions, Atlas and CMS, they are uh, symmetric at the opposite side of the rings. And some of the con con conditions need to be uh, agreed uh, between our two experiments. And this is basically our role to coordinate, to, co to collaborate, collaborate with CMS and try to agree on, uh, on what we want to do, yes. I think, thanks Sylvia, I also want to know whether, they, uh, whether there's some interference, I think, but um, yeah, usually we don't really see the collisions that are happening at CMS. The LHC is quite big, um, 27 kilometers in a circumference, so yeah, it's quite far away. Then our next question is from Anand. Uh, when can we expect new discoveries? That's a good question. When can we expect new discoveries? We also want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to predict new discoveries. That's uh, just the nature of uh, new discoveries that we don't really know when they will come. But for sure, we are hoping um, that we find something new. Maybe even um, with the data that we took today. So our next question, oh, this is a question that is perfect for Sylvia. Kai wants to know, how does someone become run coordinator? <laughs> I can say my experience. <laughs> yeah, I am in Atlas since I'm a student. I was building the muon detectors and then I went in the cavern to install them. And then uh, my experience was basically in the control room since uh, the start of the Atlas operation. Um, so yeah, then uh, colleagues uh, uh, voted me, so it's a votation. Uh, so yeah, you need to be experienced in different fields. And then uh, it depends from the uh, colleagues uh, what they decided to <laughs> choose. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I mean, Atlas is a huge collaboration and for a position like one coordinator, we actually have real votes. Um, so Sylvia um, was the most successful candidate <laughs> and was voted as run coordinator. And we will then see it's your term now for how long? Yeah, the position is you start with one year of deputy and then one year of coordinators. And so now there is Catherine, who is uh, my deputy. And uh, last year I learned from Jörg, who was the actual run coordinator. Yeah. And this year you're in charge. <laughs> okay, um, our next question is from David. Um, after the discovery of the Higgs, what is the main focus now um, at Atlas? So Liao Shan, you already um, um, told us a little bit about what are we looking for. Maybe you want to repeat it again or add something to it? Yeah, um, so... Uh yeah, we just celebrated the 10 years anniversary of
of the Higgs discovery, and that's the uh, one last piece of the standard model that we looking for for a long time. Um, but then we want to know the full picture of the uh, super uh, the the uh, electro electro weak symmetry breaking, and then that involves the shape of the uh, Higgs potential. For example, um, for this one, uh, only. If Discovering the Higgs does not tell us the full picture, but we also need to measure the uh, self-interaction of the Higgs potential. Um, so right now, one hot topic in the ATLAS is searching for the di-Higgs production. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Liao Shan. Of course, um, yeah, we have also many other things we want to look for right now. Um, we have a quite broad field of questions, so we are looking, trying to look in each and every direction and hopefully find something new uh, soon. So with this, we are at the end of our Q&A session. Thanks a lot for everyone um, who sent us um, questions and also for joining us on our tour through the control room. In case you were a little bit late and missed the beginning and maybe the entire tour, then no problem. The video will be available on YouTube so you can watch it again. And yeah, also thanks to all of the experts that were with us today, and in particular also to Sylvia, our run coordinator, and Liao Shan, our event display expert. So thanks everyone for uh, tuning in, and uh, bye. Thank you, bye.